by the religious principle does not hesitate to take his bath. Similarly, a woman does not hesitate to cook in the kitchen in the months of May and June, the hottest part of the summer season. One has to execute his duty in spite of climatic inconveniences. Similarly, to fight is a religious principle of the Kshatriyas. And although one has to fight with some friend or relative, one should not deviate from his prescribed duty. One has to follow the prescribed rules and regulations of the religious principles in order to rise up to the platform of knowledge, because by knowledge and devotion only can one liberate himself from the clutches of Maya illusion. The two different names of addresses given to Arjuna are also significant. To address him as Kaunteya signifies his great blood relations from his mother's side, and to address him as Bharata signifies his greatness from his father's side. From both sides, he is supposed to have a great heritage. A great heritage brings responsibility in the matter of proper discharge of duties. Therefore, he cannot avoid fighting. Instruction 
from the right person, from Krishna's representatives. You can see nice representatives of Krishna posted here on our walls. So, when we're fortunate, we get the instruction from great personalities. And we have to take advantage of these instructions. So I do not have doubts initially the first doubt which Lord Krishna is countering was Arjuna's feeling of compassion that he thought that I'm not being compassionate by fighting and killing people. And so he thought maybe I shouldn't fight. So Lord Krishna wants to remove that doubt by explaining the, the eternal nature of the soul, atma tattva that the body is temporary, but the soul is eternal. Lord Krishna is explaining that a couple of verses earlier, he had explained that we are embodied. We live in the body. We are not the body, but we live in the body. Just like we live in an apartment, or you drive in a motor car. You don't become the motor car, you don't become the apartment, we live in the apartment, we ride in the motor car, and in the same way, we live in the body. We, the soul, the atma, atma lives within the body, but we don't become the body. So Lord Krishna is making this very important point in the beginning of his teaching to Arjuna. He wants Arjuna to understand that what Arjuna thinks to be happiness is maybe not happiness. And what he thinks to be distress is not actually distress. That Lord Krishna is giving the comparison, he said, just like the winter and the summer seasons, they are temporary. They have a beginning and an end. In the same way, happiness and distress have a beginning and an end. They don't last forever. But they do come together. Just like summer comes, you know, after some time, it's going to be winter. The winter will come. And with the winter then, some cold there, the weather will change. We want to understand the temporary nature of happiness and distress, that they're not eternal, and they come together, just like two sides of a coin. You know, sometimes you see people at the beginning of the hockey match, they will toss a coin. The referee has a coin, toss a coin, Heads are closed, you know, so there's, there's two sides, but they're all with, there's the, the top side and the bottom side, or the cricket bat, the toss the cricket bat, you know? two sides, there's the top side and the bottom side. So there's happiness and there's distress, and they come together. You get some happiness, and then after some time, you get distress. So happiness and distress are not eternal. What is required what is that we have to be tolerant. We have to cultivate this very, very important quality of tolerance, tetiksha. Comes tetiksha for bad. Hmm? So this is one of the important qualities which is required as devotees, we are also expected to be tolerant. Patikshava uh, Karunika Suridam Sarvadevina In Srimad Bhagavatam, the qualities of the sadhu are described. Devahuti had lost her husband. Her husband had gone off and left her in the care of her divine son, Lord Kapila. 
So Devahuti wants to get help in her perplexity. She's looking for guidance. Lord Kapila tells his mother, you have to take shelter, you have to take the guidance of a sadhu. And how to recognize the sadhu? Not by the external appearance, not by the cloth or the hair or the markings on the body or whatever he's got round his neck, but by the qualities. And one of the important qualities which we would expect to see in the sadhu is this fictitious one, this tolerance that he will tolerate. Uh, Prabhupada gives a couple of examples here in the purport. One is taking bath. Now here in Singapore, of course, we don't have much of a winter. So it's not very difficult to take bath. In fact, it's a pleasure to be able to bathe here in Singapore. It's something you take pleasure in having a good shower and bathing. But if you were in some other part of the world, you might have a very different experience. You know, if you were to go to northern China or Russia in the winter time, it can be extremely cold. And there are many people also, they don't have running water. Not everywhere do you have the, you know, pipes with water running, you just open the tap and water comes. Many people are living in the countryside and their water is maybe stored in tanks. And it gets very cold because the temperatures will be sub-zero. And some places it's very cold minus 30, minus 40, like that. We cannot even imagine how cold it is. We don't have the experience here in Singapore. We don't have much of a winter here at all. We have the summer and then the rainy season. With the rain, maybe the temperature goes down a little bit. But so taking bath in the in the winter it's it's a challenge, but still you have to do it. You're, if you're a Brahmin, if you're Brahminical at all, it's very important that we have to bathe regularly. It is said uh, Brahmacharis they should bathe once a day. Grihastas they should bathe twice a day. The sannyasis will bathe three times a day. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was residing in Jagannath Puri and he was going daily to the sea, taking his bath three times a day. Similarly, Dhruva Maharaj was instructed by Narada Muni. When he was a young boy, only five years old, right? What is your age, Rabbi? You're 12. Oh, okay. You can be much more spiritual. Yeah. Dhruva Maharaj was only five. You have to take care of him. Yeah. So Dhruva Maharaj got told by Narada Muni, you take back three times a day and the Yamuna. And similarly, the gopis, young gopis, young gopis, young girls, right? Young girls. They were doing Katyayani Vrat. They were worshipping the goddess Katyayani to get a husband. Right? Are you married yet? No. Right? Maybe you have to do Katyayani Vrat. Right? <laughs> And get Krishna for a husband. Yes. Go to the Kal go to Kalingi and, and take back there early in the morning. And that's what the gopis do. The gopis did this 
5,000 years ago, they were born in one month and they, it's beautiful. Srila Prabhupada trained us that when we wake up in the morning, we should go take bath immediately, bathe. It's customary. And our ISKCON ashrams, we all wake up and everyone must wake up by four o'clock and we get up and we take our bath. Sometimes, you know, we be many people in the ash to take our bath. Of course, sometimes the water would be so cold <laughs> that we wouldn't take too long to bathe. <laughs> because the water was so cold. Some of, sometimes we didn't waste money on hot water. Because here in Singapore, you don't worry about it. hot or cold water. Because the cold water is cold water. But in the cold, cold countries, you would like to have warm water to bathe. Prabhupada, when he was residing in Vrindavan, he would get water from the Yamuna and he would just keep the bucket in the sun. He would keep it in the sunlight and he would take his bath in this way. So he was taking the bath later. He would wait till the sun came up, and when the sun came up, the sun would heat the water a little bit. Some places in India, like in Mayapur, we have hand pumps, and if you want to the ground from the hand pump, rather than keeping the water in tanks on top of the roof. It can get very cold. The water will be cold coming out of the tap. But you get the water and it's convenient for bathing. So Prabhupada explains that one has to understand the duty that you have to take bath every day. It's very important. Without bathing, how can we worship? Like here we have you know, Govardhan, Shila, Radha and Krishna, so divine forms are there. We certainly have to purify ourselves because when we sleep at that time, then the perspiration comes out from our body and it, our body's not clean. We lay down and go to sleep and the, what, the, whatever comes out of our body is like a, a contamination. And we have to take a full bath in order to worship the deities. So that is the duty. We have to do it. Have to do it. You can't think, oh, it's too cold. <laughs> you can't think like that, you know. You have to tolerate. The point is tolerance. This tolerance is so important. You have to do it. So without hesitating, a devotee will immediately go and bathe and you won't think about, oh, it's cold. That's the mind. On the platform of the mind, we're thinking, oh, this is good, or, oh, this is not good. It's the same water in the summer or in the winter. The water is the same. But in the summer, the water gives pleasure. And in the winter, the water is clean. But the purpose is the same. You have to bathe, you have to purify the body. And it's important to purify ourselves by taking full bath. Cooking and these different things, we should be purified. Water is purified. So that was one example Prabhupada gave about the importance of bathing. The other example was about cooking. That he said in the summer it's very hot to go in the kitchen. And in the winter, if it's cold, you don't mind to go in the kitchen, it's a pleasure. 
it's nice and warm in the kitchen. You know, you've got the stoves on, the burners are going, and so it's quite warmer there in the kitchen. But in the winter, in the winter outside the kitchen, it can be cold. But in the kitchen, it's you know, pretty warm, it's comfortable. But in the summer, it's a problem because it's so hot. And then you're cooking as well, and it's so hot. So we may not like to cook. We think cooking is a lot of trouble. But one will do it anyway. The mother will do it because the mother thinks, I have to cook for my family. The mother's not going to hesitate. Oh, I'm not going to cook today. You just starve. Right? I'm not going to cook for my family today. Let them starve. Does your mother ever say that? No. Of course. The mother will cook, you see, so that is tolerance. So, the same way, there are many things which we have to tolerate. In Lord Chaitanya's prayers, he gives the example in the third verse, he talks about the tree, that we should be tolerant like a tree. Trinadapi sunich ina karorapi sahishnana. Tolerant. Tolerant like the tree. Just look at the trees, how they tolerate the heat. No matter how strong the sun is, the tree will be there and the tree will give shelter and shade to us. We can be under the tree and be sheltered from the heat of the sun. And in the winter, the tree is there again, tolerating the cold and the wind and the rain. We can take shelter again from these things under the tree. The tree gives shelter, but it, it takes, it, it, the tree itself is exposed to the elements. So trees are so tolerant and they're so merciful as well that they give flowers and fruit as well as shelter. They're doing so many nice activities. They're offering their self in the service of others. So Lord, Lord Krishna explained how magnanimous the trees are, that they can tolerate so much and at the same time give service to others. So being tolerant is something which as devotees we are often challenged in. Sometimes in the course of our preaching we will be, we will be required to be tolerant. I saw the example one time uh, you know, in, in, in the past, our devotees would distribute Srila Prabhupada's books in many places. And one of the places, one of the areas where we like to go to distribute books was airports. Now, airports are passionate places. You're going, you know yourself, if you go to the airport, you know, you're thinking about so many things. Do I have a, have they got my ticket? What about my passport? And I have to go through the customs and immigrate. There's so many things you have to do. So it's quite tense in the airport. But we take that opportunity to go there to try and introduce our books to them and introduce part of the Gita or something to them and, and they did and we did distribute many books there in the airports many people got books and many people did become devotees from that book distribution but there was not everyone was favorable not everyone was friendly so one time one of the devotees was distributing books and he offered the book to someone, you know, this, and the person just simply punched him in the face. He just hit him in the face. So what did the, the devotee do? Now the devotee was not a weak, skinny person. He was a powerful man. But when the other man hit him in the face, 
what did he do? He said, thank you, Krishna. That was his tolerance. He was so tolerant that he saw this, that this is Krishna's arrangement. And he just simply accepted it as Krishna's arrangement. But the man had hit him and he just don't know. Must Krishna to control that? Krishna must have arranged this. So thank you, Krishna. Now, what would have happened if he had uh, tried to hit the man back? Well, it would have been a big fight, right? There would have been a big brawl in the middle of the airport. And the police would come. And definitely, you know, devotee wouldn't be allowed to distribute the books anymore there. It would have made a, a big problem. So tolerance was very important. It was very important that devotees tolerate. And in many situations, we will be tested. Our tolerance will be tested. Tolerance means to put up with things which we don't like, which are not pleasing to us. But we put up with them. Why? Because it's part of our duty. It's our duty as devotees to be tolerant. Srila Prabhupada was riding in an airplane. They were going, I think it was uh, Kenya. So there was some African football team on the plane. And of course, it's a no smoking flight, but one man who was with this football team, he was smoking, smoking a cigarette. And he was sitting just near to Prabhupada. So, the, the, you know, they requested the man, please, you know, don't smoke. He said, no smoking point. And even the air steward, stewardess also came and she told the man, oh, you cannot smoke. This is a no smoking flight. Please put this cigarette on. No. This was in like 1970s, early 1970s. So, they were not so strict in those days, you know, they're much more strict now. But in those days, people got away with it. So this man, he, this air hostess told him, put, put out your seat. So he put it out. Two minutes later, lit it up again. The air hostess had gone away, so he lit up the cigarette. So the, the devotee, who was with Sri Lepra, really angry, and he stood up and he was going to go over there. And he was going to, you know, really have it out with that man, you know. But Prabhupada stopped him and Prabhupada held him and said, If you cannot tolerate, what is the difference between us and them? This is what Prabhupada said to him. If you cannot tolerate, then what is the difference between us and them? They cannot tolerate. We should tolerate. Why? Because we are devotees of Lord Krishna. We are devotees and devotees should have that quality of tolerance. We have, we have to tolerate. And just like we tolerate the winter and the summer, we have to tolerate happiness and distress. There will be happiness, but there will also be distress. You have to learn to put up with it and not be discouraged. It's very important for us to cultivate this kind of... Now, how to tolerate? What do we... Well, I'm not very tolerant, you know, I... I some people get very angry easily. It's, you know, we do have a, you know, it's common. Maybe mothers especially can get angry easily. You know? <laughs> Not only mothers, you know. Men also get angry easily. What, now how can we overcome this anger? What we have to do, we have to take shelter of the Holy Name. 
you take shelter of the chanting of the Holy One. Something makes you very angry. Oh, why did you do that? Oh, you fool! You know, you know, and you shout and you scream and you throw things and you know you're so angry. What should you do in that situation? You should simply pick up your japa bag and you should go and chant. Go and chant and get control over your mind and sense because it's an uncontrolled mind which is causing the problem. You know, some people get angry, they're angry for days. You can't look at them for days. So, we have to control the mind. Make the mind upgrade. And sometimes to deal with the mind, you have to get it to do what it doesn't want to do. Often the mind doesn't want to chant. You have to make it chant. You have to do it. Get the mind to do it. So it's very important for us. You want to get over these things? There's a way. We have to take shelter of Lord Krishna. Just as Arjuna was in this bewildering situation on the battlefield, he turned to Krishna. He took shelter of Krishna. In the same way, we also have to take shelter of Lord Krishna. When we're stressed, when we're in anxiety, when we have problems and we're confused, we should simply turn to Krishna. And we turn to Krishna, Krishna comes in the form of his holy name. By chanting the holy name, then we are, can associate with Lord Krishna. Kali Kali Nama Rupe Krishna Avatar. The Lord descends in the form of his holy name. So the chanting of the holy name is our shelter and it's our cure for the uncontrolled mind. It's our cure to free us from all the stress and the problems which we are facing. To bring us out of the material platform. On the material platform, there will always be good and bad. Hankering and lamenting. Success and failure. Different dualities will be there. That's the material platform. That means we are on the platform of the mind. We have to transcend the mind. And the way to transcend the mind is taking shelter of Lord Krishna in the form of devotional service, particularly by chanting the holy name. We need to chant. We have to do it. And in this way, you will feel the benefit. You will feel how your mind changes and how you learn to tolerate the different situations which come in the course of everyday life. There will be problems, but you can put up with them. All right, okay. Just like Srila Prabhupada was in the temple and uh, he, he came in for the darshan of the deities. And generally, you know, after we have the darshan of the deities, then he would want to go and take charanamrita. In the temples, he will keep a big bowl of the charanamrita, which is, it, it, you know, I think some temples he just give water. You know? But actually, charanam is supposed to be amrita, you know, supposed to be really nectar. And it should be like yogurt and honey and ghee and different things there. It should be really amrita. And so, I think both they would take the water from Krishna's bathing and they would mix it with some milk and yogurt and nectar. It should be nectar. And the bodies will enjoy taking the, the charanamrita. So Prabhupada would come after the deity darshan and come over to one charanamrita. And Prabhupada took some charanamrita. And said, this is salt. Who has put salt in the charanamrita? 
You don't put salt in China. Someone by mistake can put salt instead of sugar. So Prabhupada was upset. Prabhupada felt very upset. Who's done this? Who's done this? And there was some young girl. So Prabhupada said, he turned to the managers and he said, get someone responsible to do this. So in this way, Prabhupada tolerated. You know, he was upset, but he tolerated. You know, he said, okay, what's the solution? Get someone responsible. So sometimes things go wrong, you're upset, you have a problem. Take shelter of the Holy Name. Sometimes you just have to get out. You just walk, go out for a walk and take your feet by the way and go and chant. And that way you get solace, you get shelter from the Holy Name. It's a very simple technique, but it's very effective. And it can certainly help us to overcome any problems which we face. All right? Is there any questions? Maybe we can discuss. Everybody chanting? Yes? Are you chanting? Yes? Yadu, are you chanting? Yadu. <laughs> Are you chanting? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you chant. You are already twelve. Kumar Acharit, Kumar Acharit, Prabhu Dharma Bhagavatam. From the age of five, you have to become Krishna conscious, right? You see, born a devotee, right? Born a devotee by birth. You must be a great soul. You are born in the Krishna consciousness movement. In the last life you were a great yogi. Now you come. In the devotee family. This should be your last part. Oh, they're all 
It's making my life so miserable. All these children are giving me so much trouble all the time. So I rather than you said, I said you couldn't bite, but it doesn't mean you cannot show your teeth to them. So the snake understood that he would make pretend to bite them. So the children came and the snake rose up, you know, open, like it's going to bite. Oh, the children, oh, oh, they ran away. So this way, sometimes you have to, <laughs> you have to make a show, put on a show. So, yes, we're, we're generally very tolerant. We have no enemy. Sadhu has no enemy. Other people may say you are our enemy. No. You may think I'm your enemy. I don't think you're my enemy. I, we don't think that. We see everyone equal. They may say we are the enemy. We are, but we don't think of enemy. We do everyone equal. We tolerate. And we do our best to try to help everyone to give them Krishna consciousness. At the same time, we have to protect ourselves from being exploited or being abused. So Krishna will give us intelligence how to deal with the situation. We pray to Krishna to guide us. According to time and the place and the circumstances, we do at different ways. Whatever is required, do whatever is required. I was reading Vyasaki's book. Vyasaki Prabhu wrote a book about Radha Damodar Vilas. It was the pastimes of Radha Damodar. So he was describing about the Radha Damodar deities and how in the beginning they were with a, a devotee who was a very nice devotee, Vishnu Jana Swami. So Vishnu Jana Swami, he was, they were having a a program to go to the university in Berkeley. The University of California is there in Berkeley. And uh, a very big university. And they had a table there and they were giving up to Saddam and they were doing Kirtan and everything. And some some people got envious because they were trying to sell things. You know, we were giving to Saddam and they were trying to sell their stuff, you know. And they didn't want us to be there. And so, you know, they tried to get rid of us by different ways. But Vishnu Jana Swami, he was a big guy, quite tall, you know, and he was a sannyasi, he had his thunder. <laughs> <laughs> so when they tried to do something, you know, he just grabbed his thunder, you know, and he was big, and, you know, and they were afraid of him, you know, just by his uh, demeanor. Just by his appearance, you know, he could frighten people away. <laughs> and he could protect the devotee situation so that they could go on and do their preaching. So like the devotees, the devotee will do what is necessary for the service of Krishna. Just like Dhruva Maharaj, his brother got killed, Uttama. Dhruva Maharaj had a brother, Uttama. He was killed by a, a yaksha. So Dhruva Maharaj was very angry. And he went and he fought the yakshas. And he killed a lot of yakshas. And then it happened that Swami Bhuvamanu, who was the grandfather of Dhruva Maharaj, he came and he told Dhruva Maharaj, you know, this is not good that you're killing so many people. Your brother was killed by one man. 
but you feel many yaksas in your in your mood to retaliate, to take revenge. You've killed many people. And so Swami Bhuvamana instructed Guru Maharaj to give up that anger, that that kind of anger was excessive. At the same time, Dhruva Maharaj, because he was the king, he was obliged to use some anger to that his brother had been killed. So that indicated there was some uh, irreligion there, there was some problem there, there was some need to establish the proper law and order. So sometimes violence is necessary. It's not that all violence is wrong. We are not like the Buddhists. <clears throat> For them, Ahimsa is the supreme principle of religion. But in the Krishna conscious teaching, violence is a sub, non-violence, Ahimsa is a sub-religious principle. It's not the highest principle of religion. What is the highest principle of religion? Krishna Prima, love of God. Not just simply Ahimsa, non-violence. But generally we do practice non-violence. And Dhruva Maharaj also gave up his anger after being instructed. Here in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is also being asked to, be, to use violence in the service of Lord Krishna. He's being asked to fight. Arjuna himself didn't want to fight. He didn't think it. He didn't think it's it's, he thought it's not a good thing to do. But remember, Ar Arjuna is not a Brahmana. Arjuna is Shatra. He's supposed to fight when he's challenged. Should not deny the challenge. It's different from what they think. But Brahmana is supposed to be compassionate and renounced and non-violent. But Kshatriya, no. Kshatriya is supposed to be brave. So for different people, different ways to pray. Devotees, for those, we are all trying to be devotees. We should cultivate the good quality. We should have good quality. And generally, we should be non-violent. These are some uh, issues. Practically, we have to apply this in our life. Try to avoid violence, getting involved in fights and arguments. It's a waste of a lot of energy. There's a saying, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So we may say, well, according to that logic, if somebody fights, you should fight back. If somebody knocks out your tooth, you should knock out one of their teeth. Like that, you know. But we, we point out, well, if, if we go on like that, then everyone will be blind and they will, none of us will have any teeth. Because we'll end up knocking out each other's teeth and knocking out each other's eyes. And we'll all be blind and have no teeth. Not very good. Right? We want to tolerate. Tolerance is required. Even though something unjust may happen to you, we should think, I must have done something to deserve it. Srila Prabhupada was giving a lecture, and one man in the middle of the lecture, he stood up and he began to shout and say nasty things to Prabhupada. You know, very nasty thing. And then the man walked out. So Srila Prabhupada just said, I must have offended him in my previous life. That was how Srila Prabhupada 
I must have attended it. If somebody does something to us, I must have done something to deserve it from my previous life. That's why it happened. Somebody speaks harsh words to us, we should thank them. Thank you, very, 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 very nice. Very nice of you to instruct me. Don't get upset. The why he spoke so bad to me. Tolerate, like the tree. The problem is our ahimka, the false ego. So our false ego should, the dimension of the ego should be the same dimension as the soul. You know the dimension of the soul? One hundred of one hundred of the tip of a hair. Tip of a hair. You know how small it is? Very small. So one hundred of one hundred of that tip of a hair. Our ego should be of that dimension. Our ego should not be the dimension of you no know, six feet, two hundred kilos or whatever. <laughs> must be tolerant. You must control that ego. So, you're having trouble with the ego? You can worship Lord Shiva. <laughs> Lord Shiva is a master of Ahimka. Kalsi, you can think of it. You can pray to Lord Shiva. Please help me control my ego. But we can also worship Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna certainly arranges for all the good qualities. One who is a devotee of the Lord has all the good qualities. But one who is not a devotee, even though they're very expert in maintaining their family or in practicing mystic yoga, but if they're not a devotee, they have no good qualities because they're still under the modes of nature. Sometimes they're in Rajagon, sometimes in Tamagon, sometimes good, but under the modes, not transcendent. But if we're devotee, if we're actually practicing the bhakti yoga, then we will be transcendent. Okay. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you for this is Well, if we don't control it, then it will have an effect on our consciousness. If we don't control, if we don't have to control these things, then certainly our consciousness will be lowered. And will be lowered into the modes of passion and ignorance. So it is very important for us to overcome these kind of emotions, these feelings which arise in us the anger, the tension, even the happiness as well as the distress. Some people say, well, when I'm in distress, it's easy to think of God. When I'm happy, I think of my money. <laughs> when we're in distress, we think of God. So when we're in, when we're happy, we should also think that this is the original In every situation, 
We have to train our minds to see it as the mercy of Krishna. We should think, Krishna has given me this money. He just wants to encourage me. I don't deserve it, but he's just encouraging me. And when we're in distress, we should think, I'm meant to suffer much more, but he's just giving me a little distress. My suffering is being reduced. But in this way, we have to try to adjust everything philosophically and see it in relation to Krishna. Mm -hmm. So we'll stop here for now. Thank you very much. Shula Prabhupada. scriptures that we have to be instructed by great personalities and in his utmost humility Maharaj was uh, looking at what is called Sashri Thakur but he never himself of course but for us we have to approach a living side and Maharaj is here with us and we have to be instructed by him Prabhupada is there, books are there but without exalted devotees like Maharaj even Prabhupada's books are lost to us so Maharaj continues to speak about Krishna. Every day, he's been in Singapore. Every single day, Maharaj has been speaking about Krishna. In his advanced stage, he's been coming. This may be looking like a simple house, but this is how pure devotees are. Even if there's a hole, they will come in, they will penetrate our hearts, they will give their body, mind, and soul to teach Krishna consciousness. All we have to do is to just learn our way. That's all they ask. And for the next two days, Maharaj is going to continue lecture about Krishna. So tomorrow evening at the center, Maharaj is going to take the class at 5.30. He will speak about an hour, an hour and a half. So please, Krishna willing, you can come and join us to hear from Maharaj. If you're still thinking how to tolerate, you can chant. But if you want a shortcut, please associate with Maharaj. Right? few minutes, you will learn the art of Maharaj. And uh, Bhagavatam class on Sunday, Maharaj will take the class at 7.30, another one and a half hours class. So please take time. I think this is the uh, few days Maharaj is going to be here with us. Uh, please come to the center and hear from Maharaj. Any other programs or anything else? Yeah. Uh, Maharaj very kindly, you know, delays Mangal Arati at my place so that other devotees can also come. So if you are free tomorrow, you may come at 7 o'clock uh, in the morning, not too far from here. And uh, on Sunday, 5.15 at Goranga Centre for Mangal Arati. Thank you, Prabhu. So Maharaj is availing himself to us. Please come and take association. Thank you very much. Thank you, Krishna.